I'm Corinne Schaefer, and welcome to Create Outside the Box. In this episode, we will be speaking with music educator and trumpet player Andrew Lyman about his musical foundation, his role as a teacher, and his philosophy on teaching music. If you're interested in watching our conversation, please visit the Creative Operations YouTube channel under the playlist, Create Outside the Box. Andrew Lyman is currently music director and freshman moderator at Del Barton School in Morristown, New Jersey. Andrew will begin his 20th year of music directing this September with experiences in both public and private schools. Andrew was raised in a musical household in Rahway by parents who are musicians and former music educators. Andrew always took music seriously and thrived in the arts. He had a passion for trumpet, singing, and theater and would always be involved in the arts from elementary through high school, as well as in church. After a prestigious high school career as a trumpet player in the county, state, and all Eastern levels, Andrew attended the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University and achieved a BA in music education in 2005. Following graduation, Andrew began his teaching and achieved two master's degrees, a master's of music and trumpet performance and a master's in education leadership, both from Montclair State University. Andrew has collaborated with a variety of ensembles, including the Jazz Lobster Big Band, the Miasmics, the Duprees, Asbury Fever, and the Greenwich Village Orchestra. His notable performances include the 2001 U.S. Open Women's Final Tennis Match, appearances with the Livingston Symphony Orchestra, and a U.S. tour with the Vatican Chorus. Additionally, Andrew has recorded for independent artists such as Matt Hartka, Joanna Burns, and Kevin Shima. Andrew has also been music director at three churches and is currently tech director at Sycamore Community Church in Hohokus. Andrew resides in Ramsey with his wife and two sons. So hello, Andrew, and welcome to Create Outside the Box. Hello. Thank you, uh, Corinne, for having me today. So I normally start with like how I know the guest and you had brought this up last year, but I don't think I really realized it until I was looking at your bio. We've been friends for almost 20 years. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh my gosh. Cause when you said you're entering your 20th year as mm -hmm. a music director at schools, I was like, yeah. wait, I think I met you. Were you at your senior year at Mason Gross when you were playing with the jazz lobsters? Yeah, exactly. I was. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So so we've been friends for a while and yeah, through moves, your marriage, me going to Europe and yep. yeah, so it's good to catch up. And when I wanted to start this podcast, you mm. were on my list of guests that I wanted to have, because I think it's important for people to see all different aspects of what a career in music can look like. Mm. And you've done some amazing things as an educator. So I kind of want to jump in and maybe I'll learn some stuff today that I didn't know before. So, um, we'll <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, so just jumping right in, I know that you had um, a very rich childhood that revolved around music. How did that shape you? Oh, boy. Um, it shaped everything, I think, um, looking back at it. So I'll uh, I'll go back in time. Um, you know, I'm I'm adopted. And I'm adopted from Colombia, and I was adopted when I was a few months old to a couple here in New Jersey. So I grew up here in New Jersey, and I'm very fortunate for that to have happened because uh, I just don't know what my life would have been like. But so I was adopted by two parents that were both musicians and music educators. Um, there was always a ton of music growing up in the house. And my mother was the one that that actually introduced me to playing an instrument at a really, really young age. So I started playing violin uh, at, I guess it was three years old. Um, yeah. I, and I remember vividly having my little little violin um and having lessons with her and doing a mini recital of like two pieces in nursery school wow um 
Yeah. So I, I vividly remember that standing next to her and us performing. Um, but that's really where it started. I mean, just the consistency of music, uh, either having it played in the house or getting those formal early on lessons. Then I, uh, I went to school from K through 12th grade uh, where she taught in her district. And that was quite a ways away. So we grew up in central Jersey um, in, in Rawway. And I attended school with her in Tenafly, uh, right by the GW Bridge. So it was an hour one-way uh, drive, um, turnpike, and all of those hours I spent in the car uh, just listening to music. And it was a ton of music uh, of various styles. Um, and then in kindergarten, changing over to uh, a cornet. So I told my mother, you know, I'm not really enjoying the violin and it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, but I always loved playing just or or just being um, involved somehow with with music. But the but the instrument itself just just wasn't the right fit for me. So she said, OK, um, and she brought home something for me to try. And that was a cornet. Um, and I remember being five years old and she showed me how to produce a sound on, well, just by using your, your lips, your embouchure. So I did it. Then she showed me how to do it just by buzzing on a mouthpiece. I did it. And she was pretty happy. <laughs> um, and then to her surprise, she showed me how to just, you know, do the same thing and try to make a sound on the cornet. And, you know, I was able to do it like that. So that was it. That was pretty much, uh, you know, what I was, I think, destined to play. And it, it music, I've learned a lot through it. I think first and foremost, there's always something that can continue to challenge you. And even though I've been playing for a really long time and um, have learned from a lot of other people, it still challenges me today. And every time I sit down with the instrument, I always think, how can I sound my best? But also, how can I make it easier for myself today? Um, and also, uh, how can I continue to expand my knowledge of that instrument? Because I, I still love it. And it, it's, it's different now. Um, but that's how I find the enjoyment and the challenge from it. I love that you said, what can I do to make it easier? In addition to all of the, you know, I want to expand, how can I challenge myself the easier bit? Because I agree with you completely, no matter what your instrument is, it's always evolving. You're always learning. There's no like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to coast now kind of thing. That's right. But, um, as someone who likes to overcomplicate things often, sometimes it's like, why am I making this so hard? So I think it's good. Sometimes we get kind of stuck in our brain or, or stuck mm -hmm. on a certain thing that we want to approve upon. And the idea of like, wait a second, you know, this isn't brain surgery. How can we make this easier? How can we make this lighter? How can we make this? It shouldn't be so much work. It's work, but not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much work. I think that's that's really, really great. I, I think that that has helped me as a as a educator of music um, as well, and specifically music, because I think that it's, it's easy for anyone to get really technical uh, with, with students of varying ages and abilities. Um, but I also know how much time I have mm -hmm. with them in, you know, in the education setting. And it's not really tons of time. So to be as productive as possible I really strive to just make things uh, honestly like uh, pretty pretty simple and straightforward to get the students to understand this is the goal and here's a few ways in which you could you could strive to to hit that goal um and here's the benefits from achieving that goal or at least what I hope you'll you'll get out of it and then you know that'll lead to the next thing and then the next thing but just, um, you know, foundational principles, I, I really find myself coming back to the most. 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll dive into that a little bit later in the conversation because I'm really curious to like pick your brain on all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you were driving to school, driving Mm -hmm. back and forth that hour and you were listening to recordings and you were being introduced to like all of these different musicians, would you say that there were some musicians that really inspired you as you were coming up as a player? Yeah. um, Well, I think musicians and genres too. So I, I was hearing a lot of um, classical music, mm-hmm. so a lot of orchestra uh, music, but also a lot of in- individual instruments and, and specifically, you know, trumpet or, or violin or cello. Um, and it, just the amazement of hearing what people can really do and how they can be so expressive on their instruments. And then also when you hear transcriptions of people playing different uh, pieces actually meant for different instruments uh, is just phenomenal. As far as musicians, um, first and foremost for, for, for trumpet, um, Wynton Marsalis, I think a lot of people would mention him, but then spanning time um, on the instrument, because that's what I took seriously. So Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, um, Phil Smith, Timothy Dokshitzer, famous uh, Russian trumpet player, um, someone that I got really accustomed to listening to, Arturo Sandoval in eighth grade, ninth grade high school. That was that was you know amazing things to to hear and then to see some of these guys live. Um, just top of the cake, you know. It was it was great. And like speaking of high school, because you were very active in high school, you were in a lot of different groups and that kind of was like Mm -hmm. a launching pad into going into, you know, music education and trumpet performance and all of Mm -hmm. that. Um, What would you say about your high school experiences really set you off on that path? I think the amount of diverse offerings that I had at my disposal at Tenafly High School, um, that that was key. I think within the high school experience, I tried to do everything possible in in the arts. Um, I wasn't just a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. That that was just one side of of what I liked to do. Um, Because growing up, I always sang. I always played an instrument. And I also loved theater. So I found those three avenues consistently something that I would dedicate my time to in high school. So I was in the, the wind ensemble. Then I transferred over to orchestra. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in a jazz ensemble. I was singing in choir. Then I became choir president. Uh, then I was, uh, in the madrigal singers. I think out of everything in high school, that was my favorite. Really? Um, Yeah. Being in the madrigal shows that, (laughs) that we used to do. Um, and that that was tremendous amount of effort and uh, timing and and just learning your parts and and the roles, but then the singing component with with fifteen other people that was great. Um, but then theater, uh, I I would do the musical every year. Senior year, I was in the fall play. Mm-hmm. One of the funniest experiences. Uh, I can look back and and say, wow, that was, that was great. And that helped me once I became, I think, a, a music educator early on, I wanted to make sure that I had those opportunities for my students um, in the different places I've, I've been. And it was, it was great to be able to bring forth positive changes uh, to make sure that students were offered those same experiences that I had. That's amazing. Madrigal singers. Okay. So what about, cause these are all ensembles. Mm-hmm. What was it? What was different about the madrigal ensemble than the other ensembles that kind of made that a favorite Were the people involved, the friends? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And I think the, uh, the rehearsals and the final product. So I'll start with the final product and work back. The final product of our magical uh, singers 
experience was a two night dinner and it was a live theater show um, in two different locations in our high school. And it took place in the medieval time period. Mm -hmm. And there were different roles that everyone was assigned. Um, but there was a music component and the music component was a cappella four part singing, different Renaissance type of music, some in English, some in Italian, some in French, some in German, and really striving to just memorize my part. I was always a tenor. Yeah. So, um, you know, not, not only singing that, that difficult literature, um, for that high tenor part, but then the, then the language component, uh, yeah. which was not my, my strong suit, but I, you know, gave it all I had. And then on top of that, having my, my role. Um, so that, that was the best. And being in those live shows that we used to do was honestly looking back the highlight of, I think my whole high school career. Yeah. And all of the other people, the 15 other students that took it so seriously, but the, the choral director at that time, um, Mrs. Tall. So, uh, just enlightening and great. And I still have, you know, a connection with her. She, but she really, um, was, was everything to that program. And, uh, you know, it was, it, all it takes is really someone dedicated and mm -hmm. someone knowledgeable. Um, and for kids that want to do something, boy, that's, that's really what you need. Yeah. And she was that, she was that she gave us some, some tools and, uh, confident direction and, you know, it was, it became magical. Wow. It sounds really, really cool. Yeah. Now, now I'm going, Hmm, Andrew on stage. I wish I had seen, <laughs> I had seen that, but you're talking about how these educators early on um, and, and your parents included yep. kind of shaped you. So did it feel like a natural fit to then go to uh, Mason Gross school of the arts at Rutgers and to major in education and just kind of pass it, pass it along? Yeah. Yeah. It, it did because I was, constantly surrounded by people that that really valued music music education all all art forms my parents and then some really strong uh teachers in tenafly private teachers that i had as well um and it just seemed like the next step for me i think i knew early early on though that i wanted to teach music in schools um and so just finding that that right place, the best fit. Uh, luckily, it was Rutgers, uh, you know, Mason Gross, and um, it was nothing but uh, again uh, just a positive learning experience there. So I I really look back at that time and and think, yeah, that was the right place at the right time, and I knew, or at least I felt, I was learning just a ton of stuff. Um, that I, I could use at my disposal when, when I, you know, when I found myself in the classroom and I was right. So a lot of people have, have trained me and helped me and molded me. And it's, it's been just positive. Yeah. Were there any specific mentors or specific experiences in your undergrad that really Again, you had such a solid foundation, but just really changed or shaped the way that you were looking at, okay, now I'm entering the real world and this really helped me. Sure. Um, I think my trumpet professor um, at Rutgers, uh, he was, uh, his, his name is Pete, Peter Bond, um, Metropolitan Opera trumpet player. Uh, he played there for many years. He then retired from there and has moved on, um, out West. I still have, you know, in contact with him, but the greatest thing about my experience with him was his, um, I think his, his humor to just make me feel comfortable, mm -hmm. but also his thoroughness and, um, what is the word I'm trying to use? Um, I think Peter Bond was the one that was just no nonsense. 
And that's what I needed at that time. Yeah. You know, coming from high school, being a, being a really successful trumpet player, I think I thought I was really better than I was. Mm -hmm. And he was very blunt at times, um, but never to a point where I felt like he was hurting my feelings. He was just sharing his honest opinion. Yeah. Constructive. And, yeah. And I needed that. And I took that as a challenge. And that's all I need. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just need that little bit of guidance. And then I feel like, yeah, I can start to mold and change and, and adapt. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if I can do that, yeah, I'll, I'll change something for the positive. And that's what I started to do and just became a better listener um, and understanding his concepts. I think another person there, uh, Scott Whitener, he was a uh, head of the brass department at the time, um, but just uh, so positive and thoughtful and caring when it came to me and my, my playing and always offering assistance. And the third person really influential was the or orchestra uh, conductor, uh, Kynan Johns. Mm -hmm. And he came my sophomore year, he was hired. Such uh, uh, full of energy and excitement and uh, Aus Australian gentleman. So he had that awesome accent. Um, but he looked and, and saw me in his conducting class as someone he felt like could um, benefit from a, additional lessons. And I loved it because I always loved conducting. And I had, I thought a good foundation, but I wanted to be more um, nuanced with certain things and more expressive. So he also challenged me a lot in, in lessons where just throwing different repertoire at me, um, asking me to come back ready to conduct you know, part of this piece for him or part of this opera for him or part of this uh, new age work. And there were times where I was certainly not as prepared as I should have been. And I, I vividly, again, just, just blunt, you know, just telling me or, or asking me, he said, Mr. Lyman, sink or swim. Mm. And I, I said, what you know and, and he posed it again to me and i said ah well swim um and that's again that 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 message uh i still use today yeah uh, i find so much value in it no matter what you do uh you know you'll you'll get out of something as much as you put into it or as much as you prepare for something um and that was that was top, top three most important lessons um, yeah. from my undergrad. That's amazing. So we've established that you are not a man to turn down a challenge. So after graduating from Rutgers, not only did you start teaching, but you went on to get your master's, not just in one thing, but two things. You had two master's degrees. Yeah. Um, Montclair State University. Yeah. Um, you go into why the two different discipline, so to speak, and why that was important for you in this next phase of your journey. I early on in my educational career, which started in 2005, I realized that there are things that I want to try to do to enhance my own knowledge of. Mm -hmm. And I knew that being a music educator, yeah, there's still more that I need to learn about making music being more efficient, learning, uh, get, getting as, as, as high of a standard on my own instrument as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I first wanted to pursue the masters in, in performance. Mm -hmm. um, because at Rutgers, um, I was doing a lot of playing and I was also on the ed side of things. So I wanted to, again, just increase my, my knowledge base. So, uh, uh, Montclair was a great place to do that. My, my trumpet professor was Don Batchelder and again, uh, challenging, but very thorough in his approach. And I just hit it off with him so well. 
a lot of things. I feel like when you're learning from something, um, if you like the person, you're going to just learn so much more. And, and I, I, I immediately had that, that connection with him. And I, I was at my best, uh, I feel like professionally as a trumpet player during that masters, um, specifically towards the end of it and right after, um, and also the other classes that I was taking at, at the time, more education classes or, um, different types of courses that I needed to have to become a better, a better teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, from behavioral sciences and things like, like that, um, so th those all really helped me um, after gaining that knowledge and then utilizing it in the classroom. I felt better um, about what I was doing um, and how I was instructing, uh, but I still felt like I wanted to be able to reach more students than I was um, having, I guess, more of a um, more of a component to the daily life of a student. I felt like I could offer more, but I needed that knowledge base again in order to achieve that. So that's why I decided to go back to school. Um, and this was all done, these master's degrees while I was teaching. So, um, you know, being able to, to achieve that back at Montclair was a master's in educational leadership through that program. Um, and I thrived in it. I, yeah. I, I felt super comfortable um, with the professors and the, the classmates, you know, e everyone just had the same goal, just, just to learn more. And, uh, with the end result of, you know, we have something to offer, uh, kids and we just have a wealth of knowledge that, that we gained through that experience. So that was important to me. Yeah. It's a more, holistic. It's like, I need to understand every aspect of this to convey it to the best of my abilities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I remember that time because I remember you being super busy. Um, quick, just clarification for people that may not know is, mm -hmm. you know, again, um, for your undergrad, the focus was music education, but as you said, you were taking lessons, you were playing in all of these ensembles. What's the difference for, for those that might not be aware of between saying, oh, I'm going to do my master's in education for trumpet and I'm going to do a performance degree in trumpet for master's? Like, what's the difference for musicians between performance and education as far as curriculum? It's a lot more uh, to, I think, achieve on the education side. Um, as far as the different types of courses that you are honestly um, expected and mandated to 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 take, because within a music education course load, you have music education courses like um, how to uh, fix instruments, may, maybe as a part of one course or trying different uh, instruments out taking lessons on the instrument as, as well. Something that is not as, uh, you know, maybe easy for you. Um, but then there's a lot of, uh, non music ed courses that you are required to take. So there's the, uh, sociology courses or, um, behavioral courses, uh, like general psychology, educational psychology. I remember taking all of these, um, biology, and uh, a, a a few writing courses as as well, um, and it's really full, all encompassing experience. Uh, and the amount of credits uh, is typically more, from what I remember. A performance degree, at least for undergrad, yeah, uh, there's there's just more opportunity for you to be able to uh, practice on your instrument because you don't have this the same amount of course load and credits. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think also making sure that as a, as a performance major, you do try to find as many different experiences as possible to perform is really important. So whether it be chamber music, uh, or large ensembles, um, maybe 
maybe more private instruction if you're lucky enough to start that um, or other pro- professional jobs, mm-hmm. um, you know, being hired to to do different things. Um, you know, it's it's just comes with the territory. Yeah. And every school will be different. I mean, I was a voice performance major at um, Jacobs School of Music, Indiana University. And they're like, again, I don't think I think for the performance majors, we had more language course requirements. Mm, Sure. So we were required to take uh, French, Italian and German. Then I think we also had to do all of the diction. I think. um, Song literature, uh, pedagogue, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that. Um, was for the performance. And I, and I remember, I mean, things might've changed. My memory might be rusty, but I don't remember the, the music education majors having access to the diction or right. having to take as many language courses or mm-hmm. the access to song literature or some of the things. And, and sometimes I was like, well, that's kind of not fair, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but we still had to take um, a certain amount of credits in like, you know, uh, the liberal arts or the sciences, but obviously mm-hmm. less than uh, a, an education major would. And to be clear, too, is there are stories from both sides. So you have very famous performers who have music education majors and went on to, you know, perform on some of the biggest stages. It's just a matter of, you know, where you fit, um, but they are kind of different. And I think sometimes it's interesting to kind of share what those mm-hmm. Are. And then also as a music education major, you get to have a period where you're in schools working with um, right. students before you graduate. So you kind of get a, a, a chance to do that. Whereas a performance major, if they go into teaching at some point, they will have not had that as mm-hmm. part of their educational experience. So just wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit, bit more. Sure. Um but during this very busy time, you were still performing with ensembles as well. I don't know when you slept, yeah. um, but you were performing with, um, you know, ensembles like the Jazz Lobsters Big Band, which is where we met, yeah. um, and the Duprees. What was that experience? Now you're out of school. Like, what was this experience performing with all of these different ensembles and touring around? It was it was great. And I always, again, tried to find the challenge in it. So, for example with um with both of those experiences with the jazz uh with, with, with the jazz lobsters and the duprees the challenge was sight reading um mm-hmm. here is your music play it and uh i was i was okay at it um you know i i felt comfortable and confident with being able to do that because i practiced doing that for so long so that was a asset for sure um Other groups that I played in, I mean, uh, there were different uh, community based orchestras in in the city I I performed in, um, in the village and in Brooklyn. Those were great. And I think, again, one big aspect was can this person play um, when they first show up and are they playing things accurately? And if you can do that, you know, I feel like you have a good chance of, of being asked back. Did I have you know, bad days. Yeah, sure. Um, I think everyone does at some point and sometimes things don't work out to your, to your liking, but that's okay. I would just try to be a little bit better the next time. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I've, I've had different types of work, um, over the years, but I think the, the most enjoyable was, was being in in a big band setting or an orchestra just because of the material and the excitement of, of performing in those types of ensembles um, with those musicians. But uh, just again, having that goal of here is our material, here is our end point, here is our per- performance. And, you know, let's, let's show people what we can do together. And speaking of notable performances, now this was one of them was definitely during your time at at Mason Gross, or maybe it was your senior year of high school. You performed at the U.S. Women's Final for the U.S. Open. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, right after I started at at Rutgers, mm-hmm. um, 
there was a there was a a paper mm-hmm. downstairs in the in the music building asking for trumpet players to perform at at the U.S. Open women's final match. And if you're interested, contact this number. So I did, and I was invited to do that as, uh, along with other trumpet players from other schools in Manhattan. And it was great. Again, the challenge there, I needed to memorize my music because we were going to be on TV. Uh-huh. So, um, and then just getting to rehearsals. Um, you know, some sometimes, again, just getting there is is tricky. And as a musician, like I tell my students, you got to be at places early um, and do do whatever you need to, to make sure that you're going to be successful in doing that. Um, so yeah. And that experience on TV with these, with these trumpet players, um, and there were other trumpet players from, from Broadway, uh, in different places in this, in the Arthur Ashe stadium. Uh, that was great. There was also a gospel choir on the other side of the court. Uh, and then we were also performing God bless America with Diana Ross. So you know, there's, there's some cool things that you can do in, in the arts that you may never think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to be able to do this. You just never know. You just need to be ready. Yeah. And, uh, just take, make, make the most out of that experience and do your job. Um, so that, that was great. And that, that's something that I look back on and, and think, yeah, a lot of people, um, can't say that they did something like that but that was a that was a really cool thing that is ingrained in my memory that well yeah I mean trumpet playing with Diana Ross is not something that a lot of people get to do um another great experience that not a lot of people get to do is you were on tour with the Vatican Choir yeah yeah so um with the Livingston Orchestra, who I don't believe is called the Livingston Orchestra anymore, but uh, here in New Jersey, um, several years ago, Livingston Symphony Orchestra, I was filling in from time to time when they needed for concerts because I knew someone in in the group. But then somehow, the the Vatican Chorus, um, w- they were going to be coming to America and doing four performances in the Northeast as their as their tryout trial tour. Mm -hmm. And somehow through connections, uh, the Livingston Symphony was the orchestra that was the backup for the Vatican Chorus. And uh, it was a fantastic experience because the music director from the Vatican Chorus um, was a superb person to work with. And um, he was delightful. He also was able to um, bring forth a lot of his music that he actually wrote, uh, for different services and for different, um, movie endeavors, because he was doing a lot of that type of composing as well. Um, and, and yeah, we, we went to these four different locations, um, two in Manhattan, one in Connecticut, and then one at the large cathedral in, in Newark. Um, and it was great. It was, it was, uh, Again, just a a life changing musical experience. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, from going to playing with these larger ensembles, whether it's a big band or an orchestra, you have also done some, you know, smaller like independent recording with independent artists. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the some of the big differences between playing live? with a large ensemble and mm-hmm. then doing something more intimate in a recording setting. Oh, um, I think there's, okay. There's some drastic differences. Uh, the first and foremost is you can try the same passage or, or lick or whatever you want to call it as many times as, as you can do it until it's played in the way that the artist, you know, hears it. Um, and that, that is really cool. Um, you know, just to be able to have that type of repetition. So that, that was one key aspect. Another 
thing that you have to get used to when you're in a studio is um, just hearing yourself and playing with headphones on. You have different uh, tracks that a engineer can actually play for you in your headphones. So you can play along with the recording, of course, timing, um, timing is key because you're playing typically uh, to like when you're hired by an artist, they might have the song completed and you are only playing on a certain part of the, you know, a certain part of the song. So you need to fit into what's already there. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've done that before. I've also recorded with, with a band before um, when I was doing that in, in college and you're all in a studio. So that's, that's different because you're making music live in the studio altogether. And you just got to get enough solid takes of something for, for, you know, the thing to be completed. So that's a little bit different, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still in a studio and you have this confined space. So things just typically don't sound like, like they normally do, you know, in a studio, you have sometimes a a lot less reverb. Um, sound quality is different, but that's, you know, where a really good engineer comes in. Yeah, because they can add that reverb in the headphones for you so you don't feel like you're in such a dead space. I think it's also interesting, you know, versus recording your line separately versus the whole ensemble. Um, what people might not realize is that you you can separate if you're recording things separately, you can separate each line and edit each line. But if you're recording the sound as whole, if someone messes up, someone messes up, you can't just like take out the clarinets. So right. there's a little bit more, more pressure, I think, yeah. in, in that situation for everyone to be, you know, on their, on their mark. But yeah. it's exciting. I think sometimes I always loved recording when I've done it. It does sometimes feel like there's added pressure, like you're trying to take the perfect picture of where you're at you know, in your music development, which can sometimes get in your head a little bit. Um, but it's it's always a fun process. But again, very different than live performing. And I think you hit the nail on the head. The biggest thing is just the acoustic. You're you're not, you know, hearing that that acoustic sound or reverb. And sometimes that's again added afterwards by the the technician so that they have control over it. So to add even more to your plate, you've served as music director at several churches. And right now you are the technical director at the Syracuse Community Church, correct? Um, close. It, it's, we are called the Sycamore Community Church. Yeah. Yeah. Sycamore. Um, yeah. So I, I've had the, the privilege of uh, leading church music, music director at a at a church in Allentown, PA. Then after being there for about three years, um, I took a hiatus to accomplish the masters. When that was done, I became a music director of a church down at the shore at the Jersey shore. And that lasted for six months because, um, thankfully I found a church, um, very close to where I live. And so I, I was, I have been affiliated with with the community church of Hohokus for 10 years, nine of those years as music director. Um, but we've had some really big changes recently. There has been a, another uh, church close by that merged with ours as of this January 1st. So with that came a music program and uh, backtracking to, to COVID. Uh, during COVID, our church really uh, was not adequately set up to um, to continue, uh, you know, streaming services or the use of technology. So, in order for that to happen, I just uh, pretty much suggested doing things there to keep us up to date, so we could have live stream services, and that's where the tech integration on my part really started. Um, and that continued with live services and a online newsletter, things like that over the past uh, four years. But when the merge happened this this January 1st, um, I just shifted my role from music director to tech director because I had that knowledge base 
um, of, of what to do there. And I'm still learning a lot because we are updating a lot of things tech wise. So over the summer, uh, I was responsible for updating the sound system. Uh, so that, that is complete. Uh, we also have updates to social media. We have not had social media before, but now we do. So I started uh, some a Facebook and Instagram page. Um, we are in the process of uh, creating a new website. Uh, so I'm working with a website designer to accomplish that in three phases. And we're almost done with phase one, which is great. So we'll be able to unveil this the Sycamore Community Church new website. Uh, I believe September one and yes. Oh, so live streaming, we have our YouTube channel and we have services every Sunday morning at 10. So just maintaining that is, has, has been really critical for our church to live on and it, and it has, and it's worked. And I'm just really happy and excited to be a part of this uh, really new phase in the, in the church life. And from your experience, like what in your opinion, like what is the importance of music in community or or in worship? It's it's really integral. It's integral to community because it makes people. It, it connects people. And I think it's really important for people to feel connected to something. And I think music can easily fill that void and give give us that connection. And I think for the church setting, so I, I grew up going to church and being really uh, involved in, in that setting. Um, but I think music in church is uh, very, very important. I think people go to church, if you boil it down, for maybe two or three reasons. And the first is the, the message. Um, the, the message, the sermon, um, the prayer, the, the things that go with that um, and how it connects to spirituality. But then the other part is the music and the music and, and listening to someone perform something or singing uh, throughout the service as well. Uh, being engaged that way is very different. And I think it's really important and it just gives people another way to, again, find, find the spirit, find, find whoever they, they believe in and who they are looking for. Um, and, uh, it, it just helps bridge, you know, bridge, um, bridge that connection. We mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that you're entering into your, I find this so hard to believe, 20th year as a music director. You're currently at Del Barton School. Mm -hmm. How has your teaching journey evolved and how has your teaching philosophy evolved during these camp hmm. almost 20 years? Yeah. Okay, so my my teaching has definitely changed. Um, I was I, I first spent the first nine years of my career in a K through eight school, and there there was an elementary school and a middle school, um, and I would go back and forth one of three music teachers, and in the elementary school I was uh, directing the beginner band in fifth grade. And in the middle school, I was responsible for the choral program and teaching music appreciation classes. And that's, that's it. That was my responsibility. And I realized, well, there's some, I think, uh, things missing here from this arts program. So within a, a few years, I started a theater program for the middle school students. And I'm happy to say, you know, it's, it's still there and it's still existing and thriving. And, and that was a big need that I'm happy that they kept going. I think my philosophy there at that time was bringing forth music to everyone um, in those grades, fifth or eighth grade. That was, that was it. Uh, just, just making it more relevant. Um, and if they wanted to continue their music education past their time with me, uh, great. But I, but I knew that, well, there's a lot of students that probably won't. Mm -hmm. So I want them to get the most out of the experience here. So that meant 
picking repertoire that was really expansive. Um, a lot of, I would say, music that uh, hit different areas. So um, Broadway music, pop music, classical music, um, uh, some religious music for the holiday seasons. Um, and I, oh, patriotic music, Americana music, world music. I just wanted it, no matter um, what music I was working on with students or teaching them, it really had that all encompassing feel. After nine years in public school, I wanted to try to see if I could further my teaching. Um, so I was able to uh, be be selected for this position at a K through eight private school um, in, in New Jersey, uh, the, the Peck school. So I spent seven years there. It's also located in Morristown. Um, I didn't know anyone when I, when I took the job, I, I didn't know anyone at all. They just put faith in me from, from my experiences in, in public school. Um, and it worked out, but over my time there, I too realized there's an opportunity to build the program. Um, and again, just going back to my own experiences that I loved, uh, making sure that students, regardless of where they are, their backgrounds, they, they would just have the same uh, wide range of, of experiences in the arts. That was always really important to me. So I guess my philosophy didn't really change that much from the, the K through eight public setting to the K through eight private setting. So in the, at the Peck school, I was the fifth or eighth grade music director. Mm -hmm. So I did all um, vocal music uh, when I was hired and music appreciation classes. That, that was it. Um, but over time I added a theater program. So we did uh, a musical uh, winter musical. It's, happy it's still going on um and i then uh right before COVID, i started a instrumental music program um and i'm happy again to say that that's still going on so the value is there you just need to have the support to start things and i i find like you know that's that's uh the the hump and if you can uh, if, if if you can get over it and climb it then you know, a lot of things are possible. This is my fourth year at Del Barton School in Morristown. It is a Catholic Benedictine school for boys, seventh grade through uh, 12th grade. And it's a really, really special place. I feel super blessed to be here. Um, and I have loved every every day I'm, I'm here. The students I work with are really phenomenal. Uh, the staff is so kind and so smart, um, and everyone works extremely hard to help produce a really strong young man. Um, and that's that's uh, that's a really great thing to to be a part of day in and and out. The reason why I love this job so much is is I honestly feel um, more focused, yeah. and I say that because. For the first um, nine plus, okay, so the first like 15 years, 16 years of, of my career, I was, I was doing a lot. Um, I was doing instrumental music, vocal music, and theater, and I really enjoyed it. But, you know, those have uh, different criteria to be able to teach effectively each, each uh, area. And they come with different demands and, and styles and so forth. So here at Del Barton School, um, I, I run the instrumental music program. And it's, it's been phenomenal. There's been a lot of growth in four years I've been here. Um, but there's three ensembles that I direct. There is the beginner band. There is a frets and keys ensemble. So different keyboardists that perform in trios or quartets. And the, the frets portion of that are guitarists. So there's a guitar ensemble. And then I have a symphony orchestra. I really am proud of the fact that when I started, there were 78 students that 
decided to play an instrument because for the longest time, uh, these performing ensembles were all extracurricular ensembles. So when I arrived here, thanks to the headmaster, I uh, had support to revamp the schedule to put these performing ensembles during the day as curricular classes. Um, so 78 students among the three uh, ensembles. And now going into my fourth year, uh, I have 128 students that are playing instruments. And that is, uh, you know, extreme growth. It's 20% of the school that have decided to, you know, just make music, uh, be a part of something. And it's, it's been fantastic. I teach also an intro to music class for sophomores. And that is a ton of fun too, because I try to hit on the fundamentals of music that I feel like the students should know about and understand. So meter, um, beat, uh, melody and harmony. And there's text involved. There's, uh, um, understanding music and how to write music. There's a creative component. Students write music as well uh, throughout the course um, and are challenged in, in, in different ways. Uh, and I also serve as a uh, freshman moderator. So here at Dubarden, we have moderators for every grade level. And uh, the role of the moderator is pretty much twofold to uh, bring forth uh, complete full grade activities um, that were responsible for running, but then also individual uh, opportunities to meet with students one-on-one -on -one, uh, when there may be a situation that requires that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes dealing with a behavioral uh, issue or a academic integrity issue, um, but it's my job to do that for the freshmen. And that I don't think would be as, as um, as possible for me without having really looking back, achieving the educational leadership masters, because a lot of what I've learned there, um, has greatly helped me as my role as, as moderator now. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected. <laughs> No, it is all connected. Um, sometimes we try to compartmentalize things so that we understand it better. But all of the psychology and behavioral sciences, it's like sometimes the reason why someone's not playing well doesn't have necessarily to do with technique. You know, it has there's deeper meaning. Sometimes when someone's acting out or not doing well in school, you've got to take a beat and say, are you OK? What's going on here? You know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, having that deeping, deeper understanding of education, people, and dealing with the student as a whole, mm -hmm. not just we're dealing with a behavioral issue, we're dealing with a, a music issue. No, we're dealing with a person, I think is yeah. a really great way to come at things. I think so too. And I think you'll get, um, uh, you will be able to help students um better with that with, with that mindset and just to be more compassionate mm -hmm. um I, th I think sometimes some people really forget that and it's it's i think easy to overlook it but honestly i i see you know what i thank you goes a long way um with 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 kids especially in the arts i mean they're electing to be in your program and yeah, I, I think it's really important to, again, just go back to foundational good principles um, that you've learned, but also just how to be a, how to be a, a nice person, kind person, courageous person, thoughtful person. Um, yeah, it's, it, it all helps. It all helps. And it all takes a lot more time, strength etc to accomplish i think sometimes it, certain people in society might view these things as weaker aspects or not as important i would say just the opposite because it takes more strength 
to take a beat and not just react to a situation and just step back, assess, and maybe instead of reacting to the person, say, are you okay? Can we discuss what's going on here yeah. and have that person feel like a human being that you're, you're dealing with? Um, yes. And I think, you know, not to get into technical stuff, but the more online we get and the less interaction we have, the more that we see that these skills are so integral to having a strong community and getting things done and connecting and, you know, we're right now combating, you know, loneliness and depression. And I do think that part of that is because we've gotten away from the importance of community and the importance of how do we connect with someone in real time? Mm -hmm. That that's, that's right. I think so as well. And um, I think one thing that I hope to leave with, with students, no matter what, what level, um, you know, I've, I've had them in. Um, I just hope that they are able to remember those, those things beyond music, really how to, how to treat someone nicely um, and how to uh, be empathetic, how to be compassionate towards someone else. Um, not, not so easily to, to judge someone um, you know, those are the things that, that really, really matter and they're going to need, uh, as they grow Yeah, because people, um, you know, we, we know this, but, uh, everyone is challenged in different ways and it's, it's how you respond, um, in those, in those challenging times, which really say a lot about you as an individual. So, um, Look, if if that's a lasting thing that I have a you know a little bit of say about with students and they remember it, then I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. I I think you are doing that work and I think that will be part of your legacy. I know that will be part of your legacy. Well, um, um hope so. <laughs> I know so. I know so. Getting into, you know, you've discussed that you're leading all of these different ensembles, what people might not know is, yes, your principal instrument is the trumpet, but a lot of times you are helping students on instruments that you did not major in or you did not yeah. spend whole entire life playing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the process of, for yourself, learning these different instruments, getting to a point with them that you can help the students with them. And I guess then my final question is how many instruments do you have a basic knowledge of? Okay, so I'll work backwards. Um, basic knowledge, I can pick one up and, and play it to a certain, you know, level, um, beginner-esque intermediate level, I o over 10. Um, and I think that's, that's important J just to be able to know um, the proper technique, um, not only how to put it together, but how to produce a adequate tone on, on the instrument. Um, and that has really helped inform me when I am starting a student off on, on an instrument uh, or a student is struggling. I, I definitely have some, knowledge base. So having a foundation, um, a general foundation of different instruments. So you can, I think you can do it by family of instruments. Um, if you understand the foundation of a string instrument, then, you know, of a viola, then that'll help you with violin and cello and bass. Um, same is true for, you know, woodwinds, other brass, percussion, um, so yeah, it, it, it comes from that, that, that knowledge, that time, just trying things out. I also think it's really important, uh, to just ask, ask when, when you don't know, <laughs> um, call, call someone up that does play that instrument or is knowledgeable in that field, um, and get some Ask, ask some questions about certain things that you are unsure of. So then when you see that student again, you can say, hey, I want you to try this or try this. 
you know, just, just offer options. That's, that's really important. Yeah. No, I don't think, you know, one person doesn't know everything, but um, again, foundation and also just get the knowledge. Mm-hmm. And not being afraid to ask questions. Um, I think that a lot of people are afraid of looking stupid or how other people will perceive them if they ask a question. Sure. And like you said, no one knows anything. And again, I think it's a position of strength if you go to somebody and you say, hey, I'm struggling with this or what's your take on this or what's your um, how would you come at this situation with your experience? You know, which leads me to my my next question is with this experience. What are some key points of advice that you would give to somebody starting out as a musician or starting out as someone who wants to get into music education? Oh, um, okay. So there's going to be a lot of options as far as where you could go. Are you going to be in person? Are you going to try to do it virtually? But yeah, I, I, I know it's, it's, um, easier to to do things virtually but there are some courses i believe for music majors um it, it's just more beneficial to do them in person um so just you know finding something that that fits for you and uh and it's it's tricky i i think there's a lot of options out there there's a lot of great places and but um you know just seeing what what offers um a, a lot of courses and and options. Um, I also think finding a a musician, a professional that you can really uh, feel comfortable with. Um, I think that that's really important too, uh, because you're going to be learning a, a lot, or you're going to be having lesson time and spending a lot of time, and you want to feel comfortable and confident uh, with that person. So I would try to you know, find someone early on. Um, if you, if you're a senior in high school, I would, and, and really serious about playing music in college. And, and even if it's music ed or, um, or a performance degree, just s- searching for teachers at different schools and taking lessons. And again, just seeing how you mesh with that person. Cause the, honestly, the, like, it would be a really difficult experience if, if you're in a place and you are butting heads with someone um, because their their mode of teaching is just so different than what you like or their personality. Um, so I think that that's really key. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I did not go to any of my you know, higher education with just one teacher in mind. I kind of went because I liked the overall school and program and I felt good at that place. And I would, mm-hmm. you know, visit ahead of time. It is important um, to to match with a good teacher, but I agree with you 100%. The last thing you want to do is move across country to study with this teacher that everybody has said is the best, but they might not be the best for you, yeah. right? And that's just going to make that experience and transition so much harder. Um, So again, taking those lessons ahead of time, checking out those campuses to make sure that you feel comfortable there. And the other thing is, is some of these great professors teach at more than one school, right? So if you've got, say there's someone who teaches at my alma mater, Indiana University, but you'd rather an in-state price, sometimes they also, you know, teach at Mason Gross. So just to connect yourself with Mm -hmm. what your options are, you shouldn't necessarily have to go bankrupt just to like get into some school to to study with a particular person. You might have more options. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And for new teachers, what would you say to new teachers who are starting out? This is this is back to school season. We're starting off with you back to school. Mm. What would you say to those new, yeah, new music educators stepping into a classroom? What would be your sage advice? I like that sage advice. Um, yeah, just be 
be as prepared as you can be. Um, what I like to do is plan repertoire for the year. If I need to change it as I go, then so be it, but just have a set plan. I also think it's really important to uh, just be yourself. I think uh, it's, it's easy to come off as someone that you're honestly not. Mm. And I just think that that back, backfires, you know, yeah. like be, be yourself. I mean, like for me, I, during my first classes, even if there's kids in the class that have had me multiple years, there's always kids that are new. Yeah. So I always start off with who am I? It's not about the course, the syllabus. It, it's just, hey, who who am I? Who are you going to be learning from for this amount of time? Yeah. So I, I discuss, um, you know, my my background, a um, little bit of about my my family, um, how I got into music, and then also sports, <laughs> um, yeah. because I love sports. Um, maybe as much as music. I find a lot of value in it. I have my favorite teams. My students know who my favorite teams are. And it's a really great point of, of a starting point for conversation. Uh, and they're not shy about it. I think it makes the students feel more comfortable. Yeah. Knowing a little bit more about me and, you know, my, my interests. So. Yeah. That you're a human being. You're not just a teacher, you know, you're a person. Right. Right. And you have shared or possibly, you know, you share interests and it's not just about, you know, tests and grades and all of that. You mentioned your family, which I know is really important to you, mm -hmm. um, your beautiful wife, Julia and and Josh and Noah. Um, how do they contribute to your musical life? How do they inspire you and mm -hmm. how do you balance everything with your young family? All right. Yeah. So um, it helps when my family, they, they all appreciate music. They all really love music. Um, my sons are older now where, well, one is four and a half. The other's eight, going to be nine in a few weeks. So they are more interested in it now. And you know, I'm, I'm waiting for them to say, Hey, you know, Papa, um, can I, can you teach me this instrument? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be patient uh, <laughs> if it happens. Great. But I mean, is there music in the household? Yeah. You know, for them to be interested in and, you know, them to move to either me playing or, or a recording on cause they're, they're musical for sure. Um, but it's it's nice to know that yes they they do they do like it a lot and so that helps me when if i'm practicing something or if i have to go do this performance you know they they have a certain level of understanding which is which is nice yeah. um and yeah balance right so okay having a family has helped me become even more structured. I mean, for the, I feel like the longest time, yeah, I was, I was fairly structured, but when you throw a family in it, you only have limited time now. So it has really forced me to learn, okay, this is my time. How do I make the most of it? You know, what are my goals for this? you know, 30 minutes or, um, how, however long you, you have, you know, it, it shrinks things for you and you need to be able to, um, have that plan in place. And I, I see that with my friends who are parents, it's kind of like all of a sudden you don't have time for like extraneous garbage. And so it's just like, it becomes very clear what's important. It becomes very clear what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that it's easy all the time. I'm not saying that, but yeah. that you just go, no, I, I don't need to waste time on that, or I'm not going to put energy that that is not 
a priority right now. So it really kind of right. grounds you and sets your your priorities. So that that makes a lot of sense to me. You were talking about, you know, your projects and you're always setting goals for yourself as our as our last question. Yeah. Are there any any projects or goals that you have this year that you're looking forward to? Yeah, I think uh, here at Del Barton School, um, taking the ensembles, um, taking the large ensembles uh, to different places to perform. Um, and I'm talking about more of a more of a structured semi competition setting uh, with with uh, different you know, adjuncts there that can offer feedback. And I, I think the students are, are ready for that, um, especially the, the orchestra. Um, so finding those opportunities, yeah, for that level of engagement, I think would be great. And it's time. Um, just got to make it happen. So, uh, and then just, um, I think the other goal I have is, is to maintain the consistency of the program that has that has you know grown quickly um making sure that i'm meeting the students uh where they're at and pushing them uh to be better musicians um and just you know for me just just being consistent well i can't thank you enough again like you were on my first list of like who i want to talk to finally making it happen in season four um, but what a way to to kick off and or I know crazy, right? For all three people that are listening. Um, but no, I really, I really appreciate it. I appreciate your friendship and thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah. Hey, no problem. All the best to you. You're doing great things. You really are. You're making a difference in the communities near you. Um, and look, it's it's really not going unnoticed. So um keep up everything that you're doing. Congrats. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Create Outside the Box. Please subscribe, rate, and share our podcast. You can listen to Create Outside the Box on Spotify, Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. Check us out on our Creative Operations YouTube channel, where you can subscribe to watch our interviews. You can find and follow Creative Operations on our Facebook page and on Instagram at CO underscore Creative Operations. For more information about Creative Operations, please visit www.creative-operations.org.